received great blessings from the Lord today. Although our service is virtual, the Lord has so much prepared for you. Please know you are truly welcome, welcome, welcome as you enter into his sanctuary and partake of all he has prepared for you.
Worship is what takes place when the creature comes before his creator. Worship is the reasonable response of gratitude and praise of the redeemed when he meets the redeemer. Worship is the spontaneous action of the, of the sinner that meets a savior. When mortal men and women come before the eternal God, they come to worship. So come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Wherever you are, I invite you to join me as we approach the throne of grace. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the ruler of the universe, we come now before you as humbly as we know how. You are God all by yourself. There is none beside you. You are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Nothing in us would recommend us to you other than our wretchedness. You are so holy, we dare not approach you. But we come now in the name of, of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary, so that men and women like us can approach you from behind the cross. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, Lord, we know that when we call on you, that you hear us. First, we, we ask for forgiveness of sins. We have sinned against you. We have sinned in word and thought and deed. We have even sinned against each other. Now, Lord, we want to thank you for a reasonable portion of life and health and strength. We even thank you for a, a, a reasonable a portion of, of protection and, and for, for healing during these, these dreadful days of uh, the pandemic. We thank you for food, for clothing, for shelter. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ. Father, as we come before you now, we are asking that you, you give us a double measure of your, of your grace and your mercy for we find ourselves in dreadful times. We know that if you, if you look down upon, on us and you do for us that which we need, right, even better than what we ask for, we know we will come out better than what we ourselves would have chosen for ourselves. Individually, Lord, as our faces differ, so do our needs. I don't know what, what my, my brothers and my, my sisters need, but you know, so, Father, do for us that which only you can do. As we pray for ourselves, Lord, we pray for our country. We are going through these turbulent times. We pray, Lord, that you will have mercy on us and bring this uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in to a, a, a rapid close for us. We also pray for peace in this land as we have transition of power going on in this country. We pray that you will give us peace and avoid, uh, help us to avoid violence. And above all, Lord, give us the kind of environment in which your children can worship you. Help us so that we can be the light. Help us so we can be the salt. And use us, Lord, to glorify yourself in these days. Father, as we close, we are praying that you be in our worship now. Come and reveal yourself through your word, through your man servant as he breaks the bread of life. Feed us until we want no more. And in the end, Lord, we, want, we pray that you save all of us in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hello, everybody. It's, it's a blessing to be here today. I thank the Lord that I'm alive and well. And when I look out here and see you, you know, I'm thankful. But then the other question was posed to me in God's word in Malachi 3. He said, will a man rob God? And then the Bible goes on to declare, yes, ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And what have we robbed thee in? In tithes and offerings. And then the Lord asked the question, if we would obey his word and give according to his will, he will open the windows of heaven and bless us. The Bible said, pour us out a blessing that we won't have room enough to receive. Oh, I need that blessing. He said, he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he'll do one thing. He'll bless the crop to the ground. He'll do everything he said. And if we delight ourselves in it, He'll surely, uh, 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 nothing, nothing that we have will, will come to know. It would all be fruition. It would all come to fruition. It would all prosper. <clears throat> so I want you to know today, if you give according to his will, not greedily, not grudgingly or greedy, but give uh, with a free spirit. The Bible said, he that freely give, he'll freely receive. And then the Bible goes on and says, blessed is a cheerful giver. I don't know about you, I want to be cheerful in my giving. I want to give because I love to do it because the Lord have allowed me to do it. But when we give, we ought to give according to his will and let it be done according to his will. So we ask you today, let every man give according as the Lord has purposed in his heart. Let him give. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these offerings that have been given today. We thank you that those that have and those that have not, we pray, Lord, that you would give them and bless this offering, Father, those that had not to give, but bless them. And then bless us as in a whole as we come together to give uh, as you ask us to give. You said when we give, let us give according to your will. So, Lord, bless it right now. Uh, multiply it. And then, Father, supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord. God has brought us to another year, a year that's exciting, a year where God is going to do some great things in your life. Thank God that he's brought us through. It is a blessing when we consider so many people did not make it to this year. Just to be alive is a blessing from God. I want to welcome you here to this wonderful service where the Longview Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church wants to worship with you. We are so thankful that you've decided to join us, and we know God's word is what you want to hear. So let's bow our heads in prayer as we go to God's word. Father, we in heaven, thank you again for just speaking through us through your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Help us to understand it and share it with others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning, the title of our message is The Acceptable Year. The Acceptable Year. Our scripture text is found in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 16 through 19. The Bible says, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he had handed the book, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. And proclaim to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Nazareth was not very important. It's not mentioned at all in the Old Testament. The only thing that, that brought Nazareth, the city, the little town of Nazareth, popularity was the angels of God came there one day saw Mary and Joseph and explained to her that she was going to have a child that would rule the nations. Nazareth had a bad rap. Uh, somebody said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But Nazareth was the town where Jesus grew up. He went to school there. He had some friends that were there. He worked for his dad in the carpenter shop there. He, he, he had spent time there, and for, from the time he was a small young boy till the time that he was in his 30s, he lived in Nazareth. The town was small. It was on, a, on the hillside, uh, uh, and, and people knew about Jesus, but he had left this town, and, and with the disciples that he had chosen, had done many wonderful works. Now he comes back in our scripture text. He comes back, a reunion here in Nazareth. The Bible says that his custom was to worship on the seventh day of the week. Jesus was a Sabbath keeper. He understood that he created the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh day. The seventh day was a day of worship. And there in the Nazareth synagogue, when the Sabbath came, Jesus went there to worship. That was, that was his custom. He believed it was important to worship on the seventh day, on the Sabbath. And I, I just think it's wise to follow Jesus' example. He, he understood that, that he, he had given them the fourth commandment where he said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we should live holy every day.
but there is only one holy day. There's only one day that Jesus sanctified, that Jesus blessed, where Jesus rested on that day. And there still remains a rest for the people of God. Jesus' custom, what he did on a regular basis, was to keep the Sabbath. Jesus went to church. He understood the importance of fellowship. He understood that he had to reach out to touch other people's lives. He understood that he was, it was his job to, to, to speak the truth. Now, now truth, truth was, was really not spoken too often in Nazareth. They, they didn't believe the truth. Like today, uh, people believe, would rather believe a fantasy. Uh, today, instead of believing the truth, people would rather believe uh, made-up stories in our country today that has been assaulted by men and women that attacked the, our, our, our government. They were, would rather believe lies and false statements, and, and they would believe these things because people like a lie more than they like the truth. People would rather believe that they don't have to wear a mask and maybe there is no coronavirus and, and they'll believe these things to their own detriment. And I think like in Nazareth, there are people that would rather believe a lie than to believe the truth. They will stand on a lie, but just because you believe a lie, that doesn't make it true. I wish somebody's listening to me today. When you, when you understand that God has given us truth, then it is our job to obey it. God has given us the truth about his commandments. And regardless of how you feel about them, the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's, there's power in following the truth. And, and Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Today I'm afraid, like in Nazareth, truth is is devaluated by so many because they would rather believe a lie. They live in a, an imaginary make-believe universe. They believe that they can do whatever they want to do and it'll be all right. But, it, but truth uh, pressed to the ground will rise again. There, there's, always, there's always a power in the truth. And when you speak the truth, it's a powerful statement. And this is what Jesus did. He believed in not just going to church, but living a life that's based on the truth. When he went to church, he sat down, the Bible says, and they wanted him to be a part of the service. So they gave him the book of Isaiah and he began to read. Jesus believed in the Old Testament. He, he, he helped write it. He, he was the one that, 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 that inspired the the authors to, to write whether it was Moses or whether it was Jeremiah or whether it was Hazza, uh, uh, Ezekiel or whoever was writing those, these prophets, uh, minor and major prophets, were all inspired by Jesus himself. Because Jesus believed in the word of God, he expects us to follow not just the New Testament, but the Old. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person, the man or woman of God, may be thoroughly furnished into all good works. It is important for us to study the word of God. And by reading this text, Jesus was saying to us, it's important to have a principle. The word of God should be our foundation. It should be our basis for our standard of living. Jesus was, in reading this particular text in Isaiah chapter 62, he was, he was giving us, uh, uh, delivering unto us a prophetic word. He was delivering a prophetic word that talked first about his mission, why he came. The text is clear. He said, I'm coming to, I'm, I'm here to preach the gospel to the poor. I'm sent to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are, are oppressed. Jesus did not come with capitalism. Uh, Jesus did not say, I, 
I'm going to get mine and you get yours the best way you can. Jesus never said pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Jesus was always reaching out to help people. He realized that we are in a deep, dark place and we could not make it by ourselves. And, and the only way we could make it is for him to help us. And so his mission was to the poor. His mission was to the brokenhearted. His mission was to people that were captives, that were blind. And blindness is not just physical. Blindness is often mental, where you cannot see what God wants you to see. And God, Jesus was trying to open up the eyes, the spiritual eyes of people in Nazareth. Unfortunately, the people in Nazareth wasn't hearing it. They did not like to hear what Jesus was talking about. They, they, they wanted Jesus to destroy the Romans that, that were, were uh, abusing them. But Jesus was saying, no, I come with a gospel of peace. I come with a gospel of love. I want to undo the heavy burdens. I want to lift those that are downtrodden. And, and Jesus, because of this, he, his mission was, was so, so different from what they wanted it to be. They, they rejected him in Nazareth. This was his mission. He wanted to help those that were downtrodden. He came with, with a social justice. Jesus believed that people should treat each other fairly. I wish someone was listening to me today. Jesus believed it, 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 that, that you should reach out to those that were in need. See, see, really, this acceptable year is, is like the year of Jubilee. And in Leviticus, it talks about the, the year of Jubilee, how all debts were canceled. Property went back to the original owner. And what Jesus was saying is that I want to cultivate a, a culture of benevolence. I, I want you to understand that my mission is not for uh, the rich to get richer and the poor to become poor. It's, it's for us to work together and love one another and share with one another. This mission was something that people then and now cannot accept. This mission was something that our world uh, pushes back on and says, no, I'll get mine and you get yours however you can. And I'm not planning to help you. But God says through his son, Jesus, that really when you love one another, then you have to treat each other like brothers and sisters. You have to treat others the way I treat you. This is what Jesus was trying to do. His mission was to the downcast. Oh, yes, he came to church on Sabbath. For the rest, of the rest of the time, he was out there fellowshipping with the forgotten, making romance with the rejected, engaging in dialogue with the despised. He came that we may have life, and that we may have it more abundantly. Jesus had a mission to those that were weak. I'm so, so thankful that Jesus came to those that couldn't make it on their own. To those that needed him. He didn't come to those that were, were healed, but he came to those that were sick. He came to those that needed a touch from the master. The, this, this prophetic word he revealed was not only for mission, but his prophetic word was also his method. His method was so uh, unconventional. Um, it, it, it was not like what, what they wanted it to be. He, 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 he would meet with people like Zacchaeus. And, and Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He, he was hated among the Jews. The, the publicans were, were people that extorted and, and cheated and lied. And, and because of that, they didn't want to have anything to do with these uh, publicans. And, and because of that, Jesus went exactly for the worst person, the person that you hate. 
the person that you don't want to have anything to do with. That's who Jesus went to. He didn't just go to the good people. He didn't just go to the people that were nice and kind, but he went to the people that were, that were, that were mean and, and people that were exacting and people that had marginalized other people and were prejudiced and had hatred. Those are the people that Jesus went to touch. It was unconventional. He went and he found people like Zacchaeus. And he said, today, salvation has come to your house. It's amazing how, how Jesus goes to people that, that we would normally avoid. People that, that we would normally have nothing to do with, that we're too holy for these people. And Jesus goes and reaches out to sinners like you and me. <clears throat> That's what I like about Jesus. He, he is no respecter of person. It doesn't matter what your sin is. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter how you have a rap sheet or you have a reputation that, 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 is, that is dangerous. But God goes after you and he reaches for those that are bad. It's unconventional. See, if it was up to us that are, are church-going people, we'd only reach out to people that are like us. But Jesus reaches out to the unchurched, hallelujah. He reaches out to the people that will not reach back to him, that may even curse him out, but Jesus loves them anyway. And so his, his method was unconventional. His method was to reach the undocumented. Um, the Jews wanted to just give the message to the Jews. <clears throat> they, they, they just wanted to, to share the message with people that, spoke their language, people that looked like them. But you would see Jesus traveling to Samaria. You would see Jesus talking to a Syrophoenician woman. You'd always see Jesus meeting different people that were not Jews. One day, 10 leopards are people that had leprosy. They, they, they were sick and Jesus healed all of them, all in one word, and only one returned. And that one that came back and thank Jesus was a Samaritan. Somehow, Jesus reached out to people that were not documented. People that, 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 that did not have all their papers, that they were not accepted by society. People that were foreigners, and Jesus reached out to them. See, because in, in Christ, we're a new creation. In Christ, it doesn't really matter. We're crucified in Christ. And, and it doesn't matter if you bond or free, if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, black or white, red or yellow. Whatever you are, Jesus reaches out to you just the way you are. He goes for the undocumented. He goes for the people that no one else will reach for, that other people will, 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 will turn away from. That's who, that, that's his method. Jesus' method was not only for the undocumented, but it was for the unconverted. One night he met this religious guy named Nicodemus. You remember the story over in the book of John chapter 3, where Nicodemus was a good evangelical. He, 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 was, he, he, he supported the law, but he did not know the lawgiver. He was unconverted. He, he was religious, but he wasn't righteous. He, he, he came to church, but church was not in him. Uh, he, he, could, he could act a certain way. He had a form of godliness, but he denied the power. And he didn't want anyone to see him with Jesus. And Jesus would reach out to the unconverted. The unconverted, the, the person that goes to church, but still is prejudiced. The person that says, I'm evangelical, but I really don't care what happens to people. They may care about a baby that is born, but they don't care about the live person when they are, are 14 and 15 and need a good education. They don't care about that person. He, he reached out to Nicodemus, and he still reaches out to Nicodemus all over the world, unconverted, so-called evangelicals, people that vote 
a hatred vote and don't even care and yet claim that they know the Christ, the Christ of the cross. He reaches out to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. Uh, that's what I like about Jesus. He, he goes after even the religious bigot. He goes after the person that doesn't care about really serving God, but is only serving themselves. He goes after the person that, that, that looks at others as insignificant, that has implicit and explicit biases, and he still reaches out to them. And he tries to convert the sinner. I like a Jesus like that. He, 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 doesn't, he, he doesn't push you away. He says, if any man will, let him come. Come just the way you are. His method was different. He, his method, according to this text, was reaching out to anyone that had a need. Uh, this was a prophetic word because it revealed his messiahship. And this is probably what most of the people in Nazareth couldn't handle. See, they looked at Jesus as just the little carpenter's son. They looked at Jesus as just the little boy that ran around Nazareth. But Jesus was more than just a man. He was a king, and yet he was a servant. He was a lion, and yet he was a lamb. He was a son of David, and he was a son of God. He was the high priest, and yet he was a sacrifice. He was both God and man. They couldn't handle that. They, they couldn't handle that because this was a year that they'd never experienced before. This was a time where they had to see that Jesus was their deliverer. And when he read this text, he sat down and he said, look, this text is, re is, is, is open and, and you can see it by looking at me. I am the revelation of this text. And because of that, they got so angry with him. You got to watch people that get so angry all the time. That they grabbed him and they brought him to a precipice uh, and they were going to throw him over. And the Bible says he just, he just left them. He, 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 they, they, all of a sudden, he wasn't there anymore. I believe the angels of God blinded them as Jesus because it wasn't his time. He left them. And although he went to his own hometown, they refused to accept him because they would rather believe a lie than believe the truth. This is your year, your acceptable year. This is an acceptable year to accept Jesus and, 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 and see his spiritual deliverance in your life. This is your acceptable year for him to open up your eyes and for you to take the word of God and, and digest it and follow it and share it with others. This is an acceptable year, what Jesus is saying to Nazareth, the Nazarenes. He's saying to us today that he's come to heal the brokenhearted. He's come to preach the gospel to the poor. He's come to meet you right where you have your greatest need. And regardless of what you look like, regardless of how you fake your life, regardless of how, how, how you are increased with goods and in need of nothing, Jesus is still reaching for you. He wants to give you spiritual deliverance. He wants, he wants to change because he's the Messiah. And as the Messiah means that he's the Christ, he's fully God and he's fully man. See, if he's only a man, he wouldn't be able to do what he claimed to do. Because a man cannot forgive your sins. If he was only God, then he wouldn't understand what we're going through because he, wouldn't, he didn't understand flesh and blood. But somehow, I can't understand it. He's incarnated. He's both God and man. And because of that, he has a love for you as his brothers and sisters. He will never leave his humanity. His humanity and his divinity are tied in throughout eternity. And because of that, he has given us eternal life. The Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life. 
He that hath not the Son hath not life. Listen, this wonderful life that he's given us, even if we die, we are raised again. When he comes the second time, he gives us a new body and we live throughout eternity. This is the kind of life that we have. A life that's hid in Jesus Christ. Oh, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, don't you want this kind of Jesus? This is your acceptable year. This is your year for you to draw closer to God than ever before. This is your year. And I'm so glad God has given us a year amidst the turmoil and the trials and the, and the confusion and the, and the sickness and the disease that are going on in this year. God is saying, look to me and I'll give you eternal life. And once he gives you that eternal life, you're going to have a tenacious testimony about what God is doing in your life. Once he gives you this, this, this eternal life, once you have faith and you know that it's in your life, once you know his salvation is working in your life, you're going to tell somebody. You can't even let somebody stop you from telling it. You're going to keep on talking about him and sharing him with others because his, his salvific uh, power in your life, you can't control it. You can't hold it to yourself. And you have a tenacious testimony. You become a witness for him. When that happens, then you are living in the acceptable year. What kind of year are you going to have in 2021? I want you to have an acceptable year. Acceptable to God. Acceptable not because of your performance. Acceptable not because of what church you go to. Acceptable not because of how you look. But acceptable because your faith is in God. Today, why not choose Jesus this year? If you've never chosen him before, if you've never given your life to him before, he will accept you just the way you are. That's the good news. Maybe somebody else has been living a fake life, but you want to be true to Jesus this year. You want to start out this year saying, God, I want to follow you all the way. Sometimes he's going to lead you through some difficult days. Some chapters of this year may be confusing, but as long as you hold on to him, as long as you fix your attention on him, He'll bring you through. He's the only one that can. This is your acceptable year. If you want this to be a year of victory, if you want this to be a year where God changes you and changes your whole family, would you pray with me today? Father, which art in heaven, we're thankful for this new year. We're praying, Lord, that you will change each one of us. Save us, oh God. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot fix our own lives. All of our lives are full of sin. But you are able to, to give us grace and where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Somebody today, Lord, is struggling to make a decision to follow you. Maybe some addiction. Maybe some bitter feeling. Maybe some history that they cannot get rid of. I pray that they will come to you right now. Come to you with their broken lives and let you heal the brokenhearted. Give them the faith to trust God in the midst of tragedy. And then, Lord, give them a tenacious testimony of how you can work in their lives. The same God that worked in their lives will work in others. Thank you for your word this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.
Before we end our service, I'd like to share with you our mission and vision statements. Our mission statement is reflecting Christ by connecting, helping, reaching, inspiring, serving, and teaching. Our vision statement is at Longview Heights SDA Church, we seek to connect all souls with the Holy Spirit, help the weak, reach the lost, inspire humanity, serve our community, and teach God's word. As we prepare to close, please remember that you may contact us at 901-774-5431 or by way of Facebook or by YouTube, the YouTube channel at Longview Heights SDA Church. In the future, please meet us at 685 East Mallory Avenue, Memphis, Tennessee, 38106. I have one special announcement for you. Please pay attention to the flyer today for the free live webinar, which will take place next Sabbath January 16th, 2021. It concerns the COVID-19 vaccine. The Zoom flyer has the information for you. Now let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your message and your messenger today. Please be with us through the coming week. Lord, you know our every need. Please let us be supplied by you. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I want to invite you and all of your friends to be a part of our Friendship Bible class. In our health study, you will learn how to feel better, look younger, live longer, lose weight, feel great, and improve the quality of your life while making new friends. In our Amazing Bible Facts study, you will learn how to add years to your life. What happens when you die? Can you die before your time? Can your loved ones come back from the grave and talk to you? In our church history and Bible prophecy study, you will understand the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, about the coming of the seven last plagues, when water will be turned to blood when painful and grievous sores will come on all those who receive the mark of the beast. Who gets the mark of the beast, the number 666? If you call and enroll in our friendship class within the next 60 seconds, you will receive a special gift for being one of the first to call. Call us now, 901 235 2033. That number once again, 901 235 2033. 901 235 2033. It's free.